Good morning and happy Sabbath. I think it's empty in here. Can we, can we hear that again? Good morning and happy Sabbath. Oh, so much better. Thank you for joining me and everyone here. Um, you know, last night my family and I, we were learning about volcanoes, which was really interesting and just how powerful they could be. And I was thinking about that this morning and just how incredible it is that we serve a God that is so much more powerful than any volcano, and yet that God wants to be here with us in this moment right now. And just what a privilege it is for me to share that experience with you all. So I wanna welcome you here uh, as we worship this morning. If you want to turn in your bulletins, we've got a few announcements in the back. I'm just going to run over them real quick here. The first one is about Life Talk Radio. We've completed the transition, and you can now find Life Talk Radio at 91.7 FM. The next one is just a couple of things to note for the calendar. Our business meeting is going to be on October 20, and we're inviting um, members to come join us for that and learn about what the next year holds for us. Uh, then, I can't believe it, but winter is coming right around the corner. We have got dates to plan for December 14 for our Christmas, and the Big Lake Retreat has been scheduled February 21 to 23. So you can find more details about that in your bulletin here, but winter is coming. Um, next, we've got an announcement from Dr. Gensler and Shana here. Morning. Am I on? There we go. <clears throat> this morning, we're going to bring you as a congregation up to speed in relationship to a project that was brought before our church board, I think, two months ago. Now, most of you have known Shana for many, many years because Shana grew up in this church. Is that correct? Yes. That's right. Okay. When there was a time when she was running around on the, on the carpet, but now, believe it or not, she is a... I'm a senior. You're a senior. Yeah. And where are you going to school? Um, Livingston Adventist Academy up in Salem. Now, I want you to know something. We are, we are well represented by Shana at that school. And um, it is just a, a privilege to really have her a part of our church family. And as a senior, she is looking forward to participating in what? So every year, Livingston puts on a mission trip to Costa Rica. Um, so we fly out um, in March. It's over spring break in the week before spring break. And we build so it's, we're heading right down there to Golfito. We're going actually to a place about an hour outside of Golfito. So it's in the southern part of Costa Rica. And we will be building, we're helping out a community and we're going to be building a Sabbath school room for them. So here's some history of what Livingston has done over the years. Um, so in 2009, we, um, they actually put up this building before their community didn't really have a church. And so over the years, we started like adding on to this. We built a classroom, a driveway, um, that was a Sabbath school room. So just over the years, we've been helping this community have a church and a Sabbath school rooms and a school. Um, this was last year, they put a roof on, or the inside of the roof to help with cooling. And then here's some, they're picking the trash out of um, a river to help the environment. And so just over the years, we've done all sorts of projects. And so this year, um, I will be going over there and doing the same thing. Uh, this is where I will be working. There's um, about an hour outside of where the other pictures were since they finished that building up. There is a community over there that does not have a church. This is their church right now. But they have a huge community of children at their church. And so instead of building them a church, they asked for a Sabbath school room, because right now their kids are worshiping in basically a tent. So they want something to help them there. 
So yeah, this is their classroom right now, and they want an actual building for their kids. Hmm. So. so you are not going to go lie on the beach? No. For spring break, is that what I understand? No. <laughs> Instead, you're gonna go down there and work? Yes. Really? And it looks like they've been working on these projects for quite a few years. Yeah, I think it's about 20 years now. 20 years? Mm -hmm. Livingston has been going down there and working on projects. Yes. All right. So, <clears throat> the reason why we're bringing this project to you is because, of course, these kinds of projects take what? That's exactly right. And what is going to be available is going to be the opportunity for you to support Shana and the senior class who are going to be participating on spring break working down there where it's hot and muggy and the bed is hard and the food is not what you're used to and doing something that is going to be a lasting legacy for those students down there. So tell me, how can people support you? So for this mission trip, we need to raise about $30,000. Now that money, um, that money is going towards airfare, food, and all the materials we need to actually build this new classroom for this community down there. And $30,000. Now, that, you're not talking about $30,000 from Albany Church. No, that's our uh, whole... <laughs> whew, no, I was that's... worried about that. Okay, but it's spread out over multiple churches. Yes, so our whole class is working towards fundraising for this. I am responsible for raising $2,000 okay. out of this. But, you know, if you want to raise more. Okay, because there's some that might not be able to reach their mm -hmm. amount. Okay, very good. So if somebody says, I would like to support this project, how do they do that? So there's multiple ways to donate money. Um, the first way is you can actually go to Livingston's website. It's livingston.academy, and they have a way for you to donate online there. You can also call the school and say, hey, I want to donate to the Costa Rica mission trip. Um, the phone number is also on the website. Um, I don't remember what it is off the top of my head, but you can look up Livingston and it pops right up. But another way you can donate is you can just give your money um, or text or whatever directly to me. But if you choose to do that, make sure to not put my name or anything like that, because if you want it to be a donation, um, that's just kind of how you have to do it. So we can also, I believe, put it in a, a, a um, tithe envelope and you can let, put a, a label on there, Livingston. Uh, trip or whatever like that and our treasurer will make sure that that is taken care of so we're going to hear more about this project between now and then and also we're also looking forward to getting a report when she what comes back that's exactly right so Shana the pressure is on you as a church I invite you to support Project. Our church board has already made a decision to support it also through some of the funds that we have available there. And uh, we believe that this is a trip that is well worth supporting. Thank you, Shana, for coming up. Thank you. Okay. The old people do learn new tricks from the young people once in a while. One of those is using music stands instead of standing up here and holding a hymnal. <laughs> those things get heavy after a while. You did Please a good job. open your hymnals or read the words from above. We would like to start singing hymn number 36. O oh, thou in whose presence we have come here, we are in God's presence. Yeah. Hymn number 36. Oh, excellent. Song in 
to our Lord. That's another reason we're here, to praise the Lord. Let's turn to hymn number 249. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Just when we need him, he is always there. Would you stand and join us in singing hymn number 512, Just When I Need Him, to comfort and cheer.
Just what I need in Jesus' name. Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just what I need in most. Just what I need in most. Just what I need in most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need Him most. Just when I need Him, Jesus is true. Never forsaking all the way through. Giving for burdens, pleasures anew. Just when Would the deacons please come forward? Our offering today is for our local church budget. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father in heaven, thank you again for the beautiful songs, the uh, message that we can count on you when we need you most. Father, we praise you with our tithes and our offerings now. We pray that you would um, bless what we have to give. May it grow to abundance to be able to share your love with others. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also wanted to invite the kids if they want to go back and grab some buckets for the children's offering this is going for the worthy student fund and then if you want to come up and have a seat here on the steps miss Amy Carter's got a message for us
You guys are good helpers. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. I heard one of you. <laughs> Hi. Well, this morning I'm going to talk to you about something that I love very much, and that is flowers. Do you guys like flowers? I love flowers, and I've loved flowers ever since I was a little girl, and I planted flowers with my mom. And she taught me the names of all the flowers in the garden that she planted. And then as I grew older and I got married, my mother-in-law had huge flowers on her ranch, all kinds of flowers. And so I learned to love and appreciate them more. Um, today, I brought you flowers from my garden because flowers make me happy. Do flowers make you happy? We give flowers to people to help them be happy. So, flowers bring me closer to Jesus because who created the flowers? Who made flowers? Jesus made the flowers. So this morning, oh, I got some of them falling apart. I brought you some. And I'm going to plant a little fall garden up here. It looks like my dahlia is not very happy. It's going to... So, here's a flower. You want to pick one? And then one for you. And the cool thing about flowers is they come in all whoops, shapes and sizes. You got that one? Here, I'll get you another one. And they come in all colors. And they come in all kinds of patterns. I got lots. I just picked these this morning. Here, you can have some lavender asters and some zinnias. How about that? Can you take all of them? The whole thing. Who didn't get a flower? One more. Here's this dahlia and zinnias. Who else didn't get a flower? You want a bigger one? There you go. Yeah, I know what you guys are going for. That's good, because that's what my story is about. Here you go. All right, can you hold all of those? If you have more than one, you'll get to share, okay? All right. Well, when I go out into my garden and I get to see all my flowers, they make my heart happy. And I come home from work, and I go out in my garden, and I see all that God has grown and provided for me, and I'm able to talk to Jesus and say thank you, and I get to tell him about my day, and if it was a good day or a bad day, and no matter what, when I come back into the house, my heart is filled because I get to see all the beauty that God has made and grown in my garden. Now, there is one special flower in my yard that grows taller than any other flower. Which one do you think that one might be? <laughs> the sunflower. Yes, the sunflower. Um, the sunflower again? The sunflower. Look, I didn't even notice there's sunflowers in here. You're right. My sunflowers, I did not grow big giant ones this year. I grew um, an autumn glory mix, so they come in these colors. And they are way over my head, like seven feet tall in big groups. And the cool thing about the sunflower is it is known to look to the east. So everybody, the sunflowers, they turn this way to the east. Because why? Why do they turn to the east? Because that's where the sun comes up. And they are looking to the sun to get all the warmth, all that warmth that they need to grow, because they are a much bigger flower, right? Yeah, they love the sun, and that's why they're called that, too. 
And as they grow and they get mature, they stay fixated on the sun. They don't move their heads around. They stay right there focusing on the sun to get all that warmth for the day so that they can grow and be big and strong. The Bible says in Psalms 105, look to the Lord and his strength and seek his face always. So there's kind of a little story in there, boys and girls, about what we can do. Right now, you guys are children in God's garden. You are smaller in stature, but you're growing, right? You're growing. You're going to get as tall as your moms and dads, or maybe even taller out here. And God is helping you grow. And when we look to the sun, Jesus, God's son, and we shine in his love, we grow in Jesus. Each one of you children are beautiful flowers in God's garden, and you're growing in his love and light every day. And you can share his love as well as you grow. Kind of like, I'm going to show you something else. Wow, I made a mess up here. Recently, a little girl in my class brought in a flower that she's been growing in her garden. Her name is Lydia. And she is growing mammoth sunflowers in her garden. Look at that. Now, a sunflower has petals on the outside, but it's also full of flowers. So touch that and feel how cool that is. And also notice how the seeds grow. They grow in a circle all the way around the center. You may have one of these seeds after church today. Isn't that cool? You feel that? Now, did you know you can eat these too? So sunflowers also provide food. You can dry them and roast them, and you can eat them. Isn't that cool? Really cool. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought it was so cool, and Lydia shared sunflowers. So in our preschool class, we have been learning about sunflowers and using tweezers to get our sunflower seeds out. After church today, you guys, in fact, everybody in the church can grow mammoth sunflowers this next year. All right. So that's what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Also, I wanted to share with you something really special. Um, there's a special lady in our church who shines her love and light, just like you guys can do every day. And is anybody here three? Anybody here three? Is anybody here nine? You're eight, you're close. Is anybody here 93? Well, Grandma Carter is turning 93 this week. So, before you go, can you raise your hand, Marcy? <laughs> Maybe before you go to your seats, you can go over to her and say, Happy birthday. Okay. She's been growing a long time. <laughs> Sharing her love and light. All right. Thank you very much. You guys can share your flowers, and after church, find me, and you guys can have some sunflower seats, okay? Just, just as we're about to pray, uh, I just got a notification that one of the students that goes to school with my daughter was in an accident and is going into surgery in the next hour. And so I was hoping that maybe we could pray for that student as well this morning when we pray. The name is Micaiah. Uh, Micaiah will be going into surgery in the next hour. So thank you. Thanks, Eduardo. Thank you. It's, um, it's time for, uh, for prayer. 
And um, it's, it's a privilege to know who to pray to. Um, it's, um, it's, the, it's the only way and it's how you take direction and the right direction. Um, to, to know who to pray to, um, it's the only source where you can get, get help from. So it's a it's a privilege, and we should be uh, thankful for that. And um, I invite you to kneel um, if you can for for prayer. Father in heaven, um, we are always in need of your help, Father. Um, Micaiah had just had an accident, Father, and she needs your help. Um, right away father um we all need your help right away but she is suffering um she's just had a uh, accident father a tragedy please father be with her and father um thank you father for for listening to us and thank you for uh being with us and being patient with us father father um we ask you to please um Give us wisdom to know um, how to manage our lives. We, give, we ask you to give us strength to manage our lives. We ask you to give us peace, give us joy, and to take Satan out of our society, out of the world, Father, out of our lives, Father. And um, we thank you for, for your patience, Father. Father, we pray all these things in your name, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing 
stream I come to your mountain and there I'm redeemed in the secret place I come to know you in the secret place my eyes can see We are in the middle of a series focusing on a giant of the Old Testament who spent a fair amount of time in a secret place. We've talked about the time that Elijah spent hidden up on a brook, being fed by ravens. We've spent time looking at the time that he spent in the little town of Zarephath, both places where God put Elijah to protect him in a time of apostasy and uh, downfall in terms of what was going on in Israel. So thank you. That was a very appropriate uh, special music for us. I invite you to bow your heads before we begin. <clears throat> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you that you have provided for us a secret place, if you will, where we can come and worship you. And this morning, as we study the, another story and the story of Elijah, we ask that you would please help us to understand how to apply this story to the situation that we find ourselves in today in this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we focused a little bit about the fact that God keeps his eye on the sparrow. And to bring you up to speed as to where we're at, we're talking about the time when Ahab was king. His wife, Jezebel, was a priestess of the idol of Baal. And there was a prophet that God called to represent him and to try and bring Israel back to God. We talked about the place where God hid Elijah, both at the brook of, uh, of Cherith and also later on in Zarephath. And eventually we find ourselves with Elijah spending at least three years of time in hiding while the famine in Israel is in effect. And this famine was making somebody unhappy. It was making Ahab unhappy. Because in spite of everything that Ahab was doing in relationship to worshiping Baal, who he was he believed was the one who controlled the, the weather, the, the rain, the thunder, and things like that, which in turn then uh, raised crops. Everything he was doing didn't work. 
thoughtful observers of the court could pinpoint the exact moment when things seemed to turn south, so to speak. And that was the day that Elijah showed up and made one of the shortest speeches to the king that had ever been made. He simply informed him, there's not going to be any rain for three and a half years. And then the amazing thing was is that Elijah had simply disappeared. And in spite of all of his efforts to find him, Elijah could not be found. However, in 1 Kings 18.1, we have, After many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And so Ahab, or excuse me, Elijah, who is up here in Zarephath, begins to hike south down to Samaria. He will pass Mount Carmel, which is, of course, another place that we will find ourselves in the future. In the meantime, things in Israel have gone from bad to worse. And we pick up the story here in verse 3, and I'm going to read through the next um, three, no, excuse me, about uh, 16 verses, I think it is. And we're going to kind of get an overview of what's going on, and then we're going to actually focus in on part of this that I want us to be the focus of our study today. <clears throat> so it reads as follows. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. And then in parentheses we have this statement. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave, and fed them with bread and water. Continuing on with verse 5. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps, perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. And so they, Ahab and Obadiah, divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as, and as Obadiah was on his way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized Elijah. And he fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And Elijah answered him, It is I. Go, tell your lord Ahab, Behold, Elijah is here. And Obadiah said, have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that, that they had not found you. And now you say to me, go tell my Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, that I, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, and how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell my Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. And so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And, Ahab, and, and Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, 
I don't know about you. The story itself is pretty self-explanatory as to what's going on here. But there is one thing that jumps out at me in this story that just makes me want to have a conversation and learn more than what is actually revealed here. Because if you remember, going back to our first sermon in this series, how was King Ahab characterized? He was characterized as a wicked king, but not only was he a wicked king, he was a wicked king greater than his fathers before him. So on the one hand, you have here a very wicked king who has not only married outside of Israel, but he has married a priestess of Baal, who in turn has brought Baal and Baal prophets and Baal worship and Baal temple ceremonies into Israel. And all Israel has followed after them. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, we now are confronted with one of those amazing things, and that is Obadiah. And Obadiah, if you remember at the very beginning of this text that we read, reads as follows. Obadiah, over the household, Obadiah feared the Lord, how? Greatly. And so we're confronted with this contradictory picture, you might say. On the one hand, you have Ahab, wicked. On the other hand, you have Obadiah, who is not just a citizen of Israel, not just an employee of Israel, of, of, uh, not of Israel, excuse me, a, a citizen of Israel, not just an employee of Ahab, but he is actually over his entire household. He is running the palace. And he is a what? A man of God. Now, to help you remember the points that we've gone through as we've re read, I want you to look at this picture. Obadiah is a steward over Ahab's house. Obadiah is the one who makes sure that everything is running properly. But consider the... But consider the other points that are brought out in the text we just read. Number one, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He feared the Lord not only in terms of his personal life, but he also feared the Lord in relationship to his prophets. And one cannot assume, well, excuse me, one, one can assume, let's put it this way. One can assume that it was at great personal risk that he not only saves a hundred prophets, but he's also doing what? He is providing their, their daily fare. Verse seven here, down here. It appears that Obadiah knows Elijah personally. He recognizes him. And I don't think it was just the one-time interaction when, when Elijah came into uh, uh, Ahab's presence and, and announced the, the coming famine. My guess is that Ahab and, no, excuse me, that I got too many names here going on, that um, Obadiah and Elijah knew each other and as a result interacted and recognized each other. Not only that, but he, he respects him. He acknowledges him as his superior, so to speak. <clears throat> and then the last point that he makes here is, I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. So, to summarize, Obadiah is a steward over Ahab's house. Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He had feared the Lord since his youth. 
He had taken action in relationship to protecting God's people. He recognized Elijah. He honored and respected him. And he called Elijah my Lord. Now, <clears throat> I think the most important thing that we have to do is look at stories like this and try to figure out, so how, what application does that have for us? You and I have been called to be a part of the Lord's army. We are part of what is called the great controversy. It is a war. And you and I are called to be a part of that on God's side as God's followers. However, there's another way of looking at this, and I would like you to consider 1 Peter 2.9. Peter makes this statement. He says, but you, and when he says you, he's speaking of you and I. You and I are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, what I want you to focus on is the priesthood side, okay? Now, we all know that in the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle, a sanctuary, and there were priests who served in very formal functions. They had to be Levites. And not all Levites were necessarily priests, but they, many were. And they served in a very formal way. When Peter is talking here, he is not speaking about priesthood within the context of that. But rather he is, I believe, speaking within the context that you and I are all called to play the role, if you will, or fill the role of a priest in relationship to the world around us. Now, let's look at the two players that we're looking at today, Elijah and Obadiah. Obadiah, excuse me, Elijah was what? What was his title? Prophet. That's exactly right. Okay. As a prophet, Elijah was called by God. He was called to speak boldly. In situations that I'm sure he was not always comfortable with. And in particular, he was called to rebuke the sins of Ahab and Jezebel and Israel who had rebelled. And last but not least, to call people back to right living. That was Prophet Elijah's role. Now, the other person that we have in this story is Obadiah. And I would like you to consider that Obadiah's role was more within the context of a priest. Now, notice I have put this in lowercase. This is not uppercase, the formal. This is lowercase. I've also put it in quotes, just so you understand, that we're using this in a, in a special way. But look at, look at what the responsibilities are. Again, called by God. Seize people who are hurting or who are in need. Ministers healing in Jesus' name and reveals God's character. Obadiah, as head of Ahab's house, was in a unique situation to meet the needs of people who were being oppressed by the evils of Ahab. And as a result, I believe Obadiah was filling a role of a priest as opposed to the role that Elijah was filling as a prophet. Now,
The ratio of prophets to priests is very, very skewed. In other words, God, I believe, has a whole lot more out there functioning on the priestly level than he does as a prophetic or as a prophet level. And, but, but I think it's important to recognize that God uses both in times of crisis. Um, to help you illustrate this, consider the fact that God has had people like Obadiah in many different situations in the past. Um, the first one that comes to my mind is somebody like Joseph. Joseph is serving whom? Pharaoh. Now, I don't think Joseph was a prophet, but he was there to represent God and to do what God wanted him to do in relationship to saving his people at a later time. Another person that comes to mind that is similar to Obadiah is Mordecai. Mordecai in Ahasuerus' Azar, gate. Um, I need some help on that one, don't I? It's hard to pronounce that name fast. Um, Mordecai is again serving in a pagan setting, and, but he's there and, and provides help to God's people who are under attack. Another example that comes to mind is Daniel in King Nebuchadnezzar's court and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Again, these are godly people who find themselves in a worldly situation or even a pagan situation or even a wicked situation, but are there and standing firm, representing God and doing God's work. In fact, even in Caesar's household, there were saints in Rome in Caesar's household. Now, I certainly don't serve in a pagan temple or a pagan palace. And I dare say none of you do either. But I can tell you that the world that we live in today is increasingly pagan. You don't have to go very far. You don't have to listen very much. You don't have to look very far to find yourself confronted with the bales, if you will, closing in around us. And the, the point that I would like you to take from this story of Obadiah and Elijah is this. Is that you and I have the privilege of working with God. Of, of, of acting on his behalf. Both to reveal the kind of person God is but also to protect and provide support and strength for those who may be under attack by Satan. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to think that under the nose of Ahab and Jezebel, Obadiah operated, functioned. Nobody knew who he was in terms of his relationship with God. And yet, he was doing, in many ways, a greater work than the work that Elijah was doing. Obadiah was like a palm in the desert. And 
my challenge to you is, is to recognize that you too can be a palm in the desert and do a work for God, even though it may seem overwhelming around you. Our closing song today is 617. We are living, we are dwelling. This is very apropos for the situation we find in our world today. So please stand as we sing together. 617. Christian